Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Live Faith, where we sit down and have conversations about life and faith and all of those things. I'm excited today to have uh, my friend David Sorn join us. David is pastor of Renovation Church in Blaine. Uh, David, thanks for taking the time. Happy to be here. Love your background. Well, thank you. So <laughs> we've sort of interacted in ministry for a lot of years, uh, just sort of running in the same circles. I've got a lot of connections to uh, Davis Church through former students of mine that are working in uh, his kids ministry, his, his worship pastor. Uh, I, I was the first person to pay him to do music. Uh, when, when he was in high school, we had him come to a concert for us. And I had uh, the wonderful privilege of sitting down with David two years ago to talk about ministry and a little bit about uh, what uh, his church do, but does. But uh, David, why don't you give us just a quick rundown on, on what renovation is and does and, and your history there? Sure. Uh, we are uh, a converged church plant um, affiliated with the denomination Converge. We planted uh, 10 years ago, actually. Um, doesn't seem that long, but we are 10 years in. I planted in an elementary school in Blaine, actually been in the elementary school the whole time. So um, we meet in an elementary school gym, you know, get there early in the morning, transform the gym into a church and uh, kind of make it happen. Um, we have been going for 10 years, just had steady growth kind of from the beginning, grew from, you know, a handful of people to seeing over 500 people on a Sunday at this point. I'm passionate really about a couple things, passionate about, I think that make our church unique, really passionate about evangelism and outreach, um, really passionate about community. 80% of our people are in uh, groups every week, and then really passionate about multiplication through church planting. And so we've already started five other churches out of our church um, that are going and growing and expanding the kingdom as well. And we are just broke ground on a, we bought land, uh, and then we're putting a building on it. And that building's going up as we speak, and uh, we'll be moving in in January. That's an exciting year at renovation. You get your 10-year yeah. anniversary. You, get, you got your new building going up. And a global pandemic. And a global pandemic. <laughs> um, I, I, I love your, your vision and passion for church planting. Uh, that is an extraordinary thing to be able to plant five churches in the first 10 years where churches are really try, typically trying to establish themselves and, and you are not only establishing yourselves, but establishing others. That's incredible, but that's not what I want to talk about. <laughs> maybe, maybe another day. But it, it, it's it's, it's your, your house groups that when we had that conversation two years ago where you laid out what, at least in my mind, is, is a pretty unique way about going about house groups. Why don't you talk a little bit about the setup and what you really ask your community members to do in those house groups? So our house groups are different um, than your typical church small group in, in a number of ways. You know, perhaps the biggest difference is size. So, you know, a typical church small group is maybe eight to 12 people. Maybe you have 13, 14, 15 people on a roster. Um, we have 40, 35 to 40 people on a roster. And so on an average night when you show up at one of our house groups, there's 25 to 30, maybe 32 people that are there. So they're big. It, it, it has a feel more like a, a house church um, than just a typical small group. Um, on a given night, uh, the groups are 90 minutes long. People usually socialize first 10 minutes or so. Um, then the leader of the house, the house leader, and we call those our elders of our church because they shepherd these small flocks. They'll kind of, you know, start the night. The group will do some sort of activity or get to know you thing, or maybe it's uh, sometimes they even take communion together. They'll do some sort of large group activity. Um, every week, one of the members of the group will give a faith story or a testimony um, to their large group, just of what God's doing in their life. Uh, and then our curriculum is produced by us. It's just me on video and all of our groups. So we have uh, nine different groups at this point. Um, and it's, they just watch me on video. And I'm speaking for maybe it's short. It's more like a devotional of five, six, seven minutes. It's kind of in, the, in line with what we've been studying on Sunday mornings. And then for the last half of the night, we break into small groups all throughout the house um, where you have... <clears throat> approximately five, six, seven people in a group. And at this point they're gender-based. So these are like men's and 
women's groups. And there they'll open up the Bible, start studying some more, asking questions and trying to apply the scripture uh, to their lives. That's kind of the basic structure of the night. Good. So this is a, a midweek program, typically, correct? It's, it's above and beyond right. what you do Sunday mornings. Right. So uh, as a pastor looking at the, the, the obvious first question to ask as you're leading a ministry, writing Sunday morning stuff, now creating this curriculum is, why would you do that much work? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it's not, I, I tell churches, it's not a crazy amount of work um, because the work is in the shepherding, I think more than anything. And the shepherding is done <clears throat> by the leaders of the group. Yes, I've got to like write questions and there's some, you know, video that I'm making every week. But beyond that, it's not a massive amount of work. The, the, the shepherding, it's the relational piece, the discipleship piece that I think really can wear pastors down over time. And we, we just sort of have trained our people that I, you know, there's, I don't know, 600 some people that attend our church that would call our church home. I can't pastor 600 people. I, and, I, and I said, when we started our church, I can't pastor 100 people in a real meaningful way. And so our people know that if stuff's going on in their lives, that they, their small group leader in their group of five, six or seven is there to help them. They're always a text away or phone call away. If it's serious, the elder of that group is there to step in. So often I'm not even meeting with people unless it's, if you're meeting with me, it's a, it's not good. <laughs> at that point, right? And so you say that yeah, to me and I'm meeting with you right now. I'm, I'm a little concerned now. What is <laughs> This is, this is actually an intervention. <laughs> my, my people might say that that's well past two. Of well, needed. Much needed. Um, I know one of the things that, that you said when we met earlier, and it, it sounds like, you know, getting to the heart of, of what these groups are about. Uh, one of the things you said that I wrote down was that community is one thing that we as a church can offer that the world can't. And really that's kind of the heart of what this means then. It's, it's breaking it down and building those connections where one person can't connect with 600 people, but one right. person can connect with 12 who can connect with 12 who can connect with six. Is that kind of the right. idea? I remember when I, when I was going to try this with adults, when we planted our church, I ran a similar system in youth ministry when I was a youth pastor and it really worked. I thought, I just want to do this with adults, but nobody was really doing this with adults. And I remember another pastor told me, he said, it'll never work. And he said, and you're just asking too much of people. They're already going on Sundays and we do it every week. So it's not like it's once a month or we do take the summers off, but basically it's every week you go to your group. He said, people will never do it. And I just said, I think you're wrong. I think people are starved for relational connections and friendships and support. And yeah, people do it. And I feel like the global band pandemic has just proved the point all the more that what we're starved for is not just to consume a pastor's teaching or songs of worship on a Sunday morning. What we're starving for is a relational connection. And we learned that even when we were 80 people or 100 people, that coming on a Sunday morning and just hearing the word and engaging in worship, well, that's a vital, important part of church. That's not the church body in action. You know, there are, I think there are 54 one another's in the New Testament to love one another, encourage one another, challenge one another. And you, you can't do hardly any of those on a Sunday morning. That happens in community. And so we just said from the very beginning, I looked at our church when we were 100 people and I said, I want you to know this isn't your community and it'll never be your community because you can't know, support, challenge, admonish 100 people. And so we've just always made our community in the, in the groups. And so as we grew it, in a sense, it made it easier to grow because people didn't say like, oh, now we're 200 people. I feel like I don't know everyone. That was never the goal in the first place. It was to know the people in their house group. So why don't you share a little bit what, what that community looks like in that house group for an average attender in a day-to-day -day sort of process? Right. Um, you know, so even just meeting every week is completely, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Non-traditional for a modern American. I read some study, mm -hmm. I think the average adult once you like get into the kids stage you know and you know, little ones run around they meet with other adult friends like three times a year you know that's the modern american you know it wasn't maybe like that for our parents or grandparents generation but that's what it's like for people that are 20 years old and 35 years old nowadays and so just the fact that you're in this group and you're meeting with other adults 35 times a year 
you, you're really different. <laughs> you have way more adult social interaction. The friendships run a lot deeper. And so the support is really there. Our groups, they're texting each other all the time. They're hanging out outside a group. And because the relationships are deep, they're there for one, each other, one, one another in crisis. You know, when, when funerals happen, when babies are born, you know, if you're in a group, I mean, you've got people, in a sense, it's like the old fashioned small church, what it used to be, you know, people are bringing meals all the time. They're supporting you. Um, and part of that too, is we let the relationships run deep. And so one of the things that the modern church has done with small groups that I really dislike is they've taken this sort of consumeristic approach. They've lowered the bar so low where they say, okay, why don't you try a group for six weeks? And then next month, we're going to do a new trimester and we're going to mix up the groups again. And then we'll do another trimester. And they're trying to lower the bar so people can get in. But then you never develop a relationship. And I just can't imagine like Peter and the Jerusalem church saying, all right, guys, new trimester. We're mixing up your house churches. Uh, and so our, our groups stay together. I've been in the same group for 10 years. And so those friendships and relationships are, are, are deep. So how is it that you move somebody from, I want to check out renovation to house church to maybe moving up into the small group positions? What, what, what's sort of the, the drive to get that done? It's just, um, you know, it's vision, I think, uh, is something that you just bring all the time to your people. So we talk about house groups all the time. You know, I'm mentioning it multiple times a month in my messages. Hey, when you get in your house groups later, you're going to talk about this. And we tell our people when they kind of go through the on-ramp of our church that, hey, what we do is we do house groups. I'll say, well, what about, do you have men's ministry? Do you have this? Do you have, and then we just do house groups. Because we believe all those things are sort of embedded in house groups. And so if, you, if you're looking for something else, then we're maybe not the church for you. So it's talked about a lot. And I think that's part of the reason that we have 80% of our people in a group is it's simple. It's not complex. And then as far as moving people up, we just watch over time. I mean, we have a really slow philosophy of appointing leaders. So if somebody comes in and says, hey, I was on the board of my last church, I'll say, that's great. I'm just going to watch you for three or four years and see if we see the Holy Spirit's leadership giftings in you and just slowly move people up. So. so what do you say to that person who shows up Sunday morning and says, house groups aren't my thing. I don't really want to connect there. Right. I usually tell them that <clears throat> they're certainly entitled to that opinion, but they're going to feel really uncomfortable if they make renovation church their home. And I'm never going to apologize to them for that. So they, I'm not going to tell them they can attend our church, but they will. we're going to tell them that to be a disciple, to be a follower of Jesus, you have to be in community. Jesus is so focused on community all the time that he spends with his disciples. You know, the model of you look at the model of the early church and how often they were meeting. You read Acts 2, 3, or 4. The idea of just coming and consuming a service on Sunday morning and calling that church, it's just not church. And so I just tell them that we're going to continue to say that. And so you, you might feel uncomfortable if that's what you decide. So I, I know one of the other things you do is, is some, some coaching and some encouragement to, uh, of other pastors in church ministries. What is your uh, sort of encouragement and, and drive uh, as, as far as other churches go? What would you say to them in order to develop, to have them develop their community? I think that it just has to come from the pastor's heart and vision. Because this ministry has been really successful for us in the last 10 years, there have been five or six churches that have taken the model and tried to implement it in their church. And uh, for almost all of them, it's failed. And it's because that they didn't put their passion and heart behind it. Like it wasn't a core value of their church. They just said, oh yeah, well, every church has like some sort of small groups or weekly Bible study or something. And they said, well, we're just going to do this house groups thing. But then they didn't talk about it. They didn't, you know, preach on it. They didn't bring it up often. And so it didn't, it didn't work. And so it has to be a core value of who you are. I, I think I read once, oh, I'm going to mess up these numbers, but it's something like if, if a pastor, if a pastor isn't, doesn't talk often about small groups, their church will never have a higher than 50% participation. Like that's the ceiling. And then it, I can't remember the other number, but there's another one that says, and if the pastor himself is not in a small group, then it, it lowers the, 
the ceiling even more. And so I'll talk about it a lot too. I'll say, yeah, you know, I was hanging out with my small group guys. And so people know that I, I, it's important too. So that sense of community, it's, it's, it's not just something that you're doing. It's from, from the pastor, it's a priority for the board. It's a priority for the attenders. It's a priority. This is something that we do. This is a non-negotiable. And if we don't do it, we aren't who we say we are. Right. You, you can't be on our staff, on our board, in any sort of leadership position if you're not a regular attender at your house group. No. Well, that's, <laughs> that's a lot to think about. I, I, I love your guys' model, and, and it's, I, I hate saying model even because it's not so much a model. It's who you are. Right. You know, another thing that, we, that I want to say about it, too, that, that we feel is, is different than at least a lot of suburban churches around us, and I feel like it's a sometimes we call ourselves the anti-consumerism church and that I, I just don't want to leverage consumerism for just so I can have a measure of effectiveness. I just want to stick to the word of God and I, and I want to see discipleship. And so I felt like when I was getting into ministry, every model was based on like demographics. Cause that's, again, that's an easy way to lower the bar. We can say, you know, are you 27 to 29 and just had your first kid? then we've got the group for you. And you kind of sign up on, I think they were called like affinity based groups is probably the technical term for them. And we just felt like, again, I just, I just can't see Peter saying like, all right, like, are you into shepherding, you know, or whatever. And so our groups are completely intergenerational. And so on a roster of 40 people, you have an 18 year old and you have a 75 year old. And because there are 40 people on a roster, there still are enough people in your generation that you can connect with. You can connect with, if you're a young parent, you can connect with the other young parents, but you also get to rub shoulders with someone who's been walking with Christ twice as long as you've been alive. And I feel like we need that in the church again. Um, not just, all right, let's get all the 24 year olds together. So uh, that, I think that's really helped the spiritual growth of our groups over the years too. Yeah. Well, and, and especially when you're looking at those community groups, not just as a small group that's sort of on the side doing their thing. In a lot of ways, that's the core part of the body of Christ. And if you've got a, a community group of all left arms, right, you know, right. it's, it's going to be awkward. Right. And, and we've, we've talked, uh, we had an episode of this where we talked with James Rock about Faith for Exiles, which I, I s- suspect you might be familiar with that book. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's one of the things I highlight there too. We, we want to be in community, not just with people who look like us, but the people who can build into us and grow us right. and develop the faith in that biblical model. Well, thank you for your time, David. This is lots to chew on. Uh, I I've greatly appreciate your ministry. I, I think I sent a message roundabout way that we stole some of your stuff for a Sunday morning recently. Thank you for that. Right. I uh, wanted to ask you one closing question. Uh, I'm going to sort of spring on you, but you're brilliant. You'll deal with it. What's, what's one encouragement that you would give the average person uh, on how they can live out their faith in their day-to-day life? Live out their faith on the, in their day-to-day life. You know, I just, great I, it's great when I spring this on you right at the no, last minute. No, yeah, right. so. You'll get a good authentic answer then. Um, yeah, I just feel like the Lord's been teaching me so much lately on just humility um, and that if we really want to do faith in the day-to-day life, we've got to see how much we need God. Um, we just have so much self-reliance. Um, and one of the main reasons we don't come to him, we don't ask him for things throughout the day is because we just don't think we need to. And because our, our self-inflated pride has taken over um if we want to see god move then we got to humble ourselves there's a quote i have on my wall that i'm going to turn my computer to read from jim Simbola. that's always i read probably like once a day um and he he just he, he says this he says god is attracted to weakness he can't resist those who humbly and honestly admit how desperately they need him our weakness in fact makes room for his power um and it's just this acknowledgement every day that you get up and you meet with the Lord and you say, I'm not bringing much to the table today, Lord. <laughs> so I'm going to need your help. And just to, I'm, I'm, the Lord's just teaching me to do that on a, on a daily level. And that's been helpful to me. I don't know if that's helpful to anyone else, but that's all I got. 
That's some great words. And uh, frankly, I think that's something I need to hear today. So thank you, David. Appreciate yep. your time. Thank yep. you, everybody, for tuning in to Live Faith. We will see you next time. God bless you.